Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, uh, in today's class we will talk about few of the challenges in tissue engineering and few of the developments done to tackle these challenges. The topics which will be covered are scaffold fabrication, the challenges associated with scaffold fabrication in uh, we uh, and we are using uh, we are discussing about three different tissues that is bone tissue, skin tissue and uh, heart tissue. In the as a second challenge, we will talk about vascularization in tissue engineering and also we will talk about selection of proper cells. Scaffold fabrication, as we know scaffolds are temporary support material which will enable cells to attach, grow and form a 3D structure. Hence, scaffold must meet the chemical and physical properties of the natural ECM and also scaffold must degrade over a period of time, so that the uh, tissue regeneration to take place. As we know different tissues have different regeneration time for example, skin tissue regenerates faster than the bone tissue. Hence, scaffold must meet the regeneration time of the uh, tissue of our interest and biocompatibility of the uh, scaffolds. It is must that scaffold should not cause any toxicity to the host cells. Uh, in the 80s when pioneers in the field when they proposed polyhydrides for biomedical application, the scientific, scientific community thought that these uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic materials would cause toxicity to the host cells. This belief was persistent until 1996 until FDA approves first synthetic polymer for biomedical application. Hence, it is necessary to see the toxic, uh, toxic uh, uh, compatibility of these scaffolds to the host cells. Let us begin with the bone tissue. As we know bone tissue, bone is a hard tissue, hence a scaffold which we fabricate for bone tissue engineering should have high mechanical strength. And it is explained in three different steps which is known as biome biomechanical paradigm of bone tissue engineering. The mechanical strength of uh, scaffold should match with the our natural bone tissue. At the same time it should not have it should not induce stress shielding effect which is prevalent in uh, metallic implant. What happens in metallic implants is due to their high mechanical strength all the load will be taken up by the will be, will be taken up by the uh, metallic implants as you see here this is the uh, this is the metal Im metallic implant and uh, this metallic implant due to their high mechanical strength they take up all the load and the region uh, and the region which is uh, near to the uh, metallic implant fail to take the load which is necessary uh, which is which is necessary for it to take so as you see uh, the reason uh, sorry as you see the reason farther from the uh, metallic implant has higher bone mass compared to the reason which is uh, near to the metallic implant. This reason does not have uh, sufficient bone mass which is supposed to possess. Hence eventually the regenerated bone will fail to take up the load. Hence it is necessary that the scaffold which we prepare should not induce the stress shielding effect. Second, uh, second uh, step is the mechanical property of the scaffold should be in such a way that it induces the sca uh, scaffold to scaffold to bone mechanotransduction. Pro mechanical stimulus provided by the scaffold induces the tissue differentiation. In the undifferentiated stem cells, the mechanical stimulus uh, causes the differentiation of the cells, whereas in differentiated cells, the it leads to the matrix production by the differentiated cells. And in the third steps as the host uh, bone tissue regenerates it takes up the load as the scaffold degrades. Uh, recent development is degradable, degradable uh, metallic implant. Uh, what the, in this study what they have done is they have used magnesium alloy and to see uh, their degradation profile and this this image is the uh, this image is the degradable polymer and this one is the uh, 
magnesium alloy in vivo staining using calcium uh, green. As you see here, the region which is near to the magnesium alloy has has sufficient bone growth formation compared to the degradable polymer. And here are the few, uh, here are the compressive strength and elastic modulus of cancellous bone and cortical bone are given. And second uh, most uh, second most important parameter while designing the scaffold for bone tissue engineering is the porosity. Bone is highly porous in nature and it is defined in three different terminologies pore size, pore volume and interconnectivity between the pores. Uh, while designing the uh, scaffolds for bone tissue, we should consider all these three parameters. And as we know, the bone is having high mechanical strength and it at the same time it is highly porous. So, balancing these two is a real challenge in bone tissue engineering. Let us go to the skin tissue. Uh, this is the general structure of skin tissue, the upper epidermal layer followed by the dermal layer. If the skin injury is limited to the epidermal layer, what happens is the, the fibroblasts present in the dermal layer, they migrate towards the epidermal layer and they start differentiating and secreting extracellular matrix and thereby they fill up the gap. If the skin injury is very deep, wherein the dermal layer is also lost, then the clinical interventions are necessary. Here are a few challenges listed for skin tissue engineering, scarring of the tissue. As I explained in the previous slide, the fibroblasts present in the dermal layer, they migrate towards the skin uh, injured site and they start uh, secreting the extracellular matrix and uh, what happens is they, they secrete a collagen uh, in excess than what it is what it is required. This excessive collagen it cross links and uh, contracts and that leads to the scarring of the tissue and avoiding such a scarring of the tissue is one of the challenges in skin tissue engineering. As we know skin is the outermost layer of our body preventing from microbial infection. Hence, when we prepare scaffold for bone skin tissue engineering, it is necessary that it should have antimicrobial property. And also the scaffold which we prepare for uh, skin tissue engineering should be a hydrogel should able to keep the environment moist and at the same time should able to absorb the exudates from the wound. Uh, Let us go back to the previous slide as you see here the epidermal layer and the dermal layer the connected with the basement membrane. This basement membrane is, uh, is rich with extracellular matrix secreted by the fibroblast cells and uh, this basement membrane uh, is involved in several functions of the skin tissue and reconstruction of this basement membrane is one of the challenges in skin tissue engineering. We will talk great in great detail about the vascularization and other complicated challenges such as reconstruction of the skin appendages, thermoregulation, touch and excretions are few of the challenges in skin tissue engineering. In the uh, scaffold, uh, they try to uh, see whether they can able to produce the sweat gland. Uh, sweat gland. What they have done was the they have they have isolated epidermal progenitor cells from the dorsal region of the dorsal region of the mice, and they have mixed it with the plantar region plantar region dermal ecm, which has cues for the sweat gland formation. As a control, they have used dermal uh, dorsal region uh, ecm, uh, which has uh, cues for the stratified epithelium formation, but not for the sweat gland. And this mixture they fed to the uh, 3D bioprinter, bioprinter and they try to see whether they could able to produce this sweat gland or not. And the third tissue which we will be talking about is the heart tissue. The, these are the few challenges listed in heart tissue engineering, we will talk about only those which are, uh, which are related to the scaffold fabrication. Electromechanical integration between the, between the transplanted engineering myocardial tissue tissue and the host myocardium is one of the challenge in uh, heart tissue engineering. Recent, uh, recent development is the uh, usage of conducting polymers. For example, polyaniline is a conducting polymer and the conductivity of this polymer is dependent on the uh, proton based doping process. Uh, wherein what will happen is uh, the imine and amino groups of aniline are protonated in the presence of protonic acid. And uh, uh, there are few challenges associated with this conducting polymer. When we implant this conducting polymer in vivo, the dopants, uh, 
the dopants which keep the pro, um, imine and amino groups protonated they are lost in the process called d-doping. That leads to the decrease in conductivity of these conducting polymers uh, and it will not last for longer time. So, another challenge associated with polyaniline is uh, the amine groups of aniline are lost at uh, physiological uh, conditions. So, in this study what they have done is they have used chitosan, chitosan is a rich source of amine group and they uh, fabricated uh, chitosan film on top of which they polymerized aniline in the presence of phytic acid. And uh, as, we, uh, as we know the uh, chitosan uh, plays a role of uh, uh, plays a role of amine group source and they try to solve the problem of deprotonation. And another problem is uh, contraction ability of the uh, scaffolds. As we know the heart is highly contractile in nature producing the scaffold which has the contracting ability is one of the challenge in heart tissue engineering. And the another challenge is full coapitation. As we know heart, heart is made up of valves. These valves make sure that the blood is blood flows in a right direction and these valves are able to contract contract and relax producing such a wall which are uh, which can able to contract and relax is one of the challenge in heart tissue engineering. Uh, as we all know vascular network uh, mediate gas exchange they excrete the metabolic waste and they supply the nutrient. What will happen if we prepare a scaffold without vascular network within it uh, the diffusion process will take place. Diffu but, uh, but however, the diffusion is limited to 100 to 200 micrometer uh, micrometer of uh, distance. Uh, beyond that the cell cells stop of nutrients and oxygen and they eventually die. Hence, it is necessary to include the vascular network when we design the scaffold. The ideal engineered vessels must be able to withstand physiological pressure without any leakage and they should not be thrombogenic, they should not elicit any immunological response and they, they must be economically viable. And there are several strategies to uh, introduce vascular network into the scaffold and can be broadly classified under four categories that is scaffold design, supplement of angiogenic factors, in vivo prevascularization and in vitro prevascularization. Let us discuss each in detail. The first one is scaffold design. One of the major prere prerequisite for, uh, for uh, introducing vascular network into the scaffold is porosity of the scaffold. The, uh, the scaffold must be uh, highly porous and, uh, and highly, interconnect, highly interconnected. And there are several strategies through which we can prepare the porous scaffold and few of the techniques are listed over here. For example, gas foaming, galacto spinning, particulate leaching, freeze drying, phase separation and microfabrication. The second approach is supplement of angiogenic factor. Just by supplying the growth factor which are involved in angiogenesis, we can achieve the uh, vascularization in uh, vascularization in tissue engineering scaffold. Few of the growth factor which are involved in angiogenesis are listed over here. There are two ways through which we can uh, supply these growth factors one by release by diffusion which is a direct method and the second one is release by cell demand this is an indirect method. Let us talk about uh, these methods uh, in brief. Release by diffusion in this method we supply the growth factor which are directly involved in angiogenesis for example, VEGF. But we do not know how much exact amount of uh, these growth factor need to be supplied for vessel formation. Hence, what happens is that leads to the unhealthy vessel formation as you see in the upper image. The second method is release by cell demand. In this method you supply the growth factors to the cells and these growth factor in turn stimulate the cells to secrete the angiogenic growth factor. Thereby you can control the release of these angiogenic growth factor thereby we can achieve the healthy vascular network as you see in the lower image. The third approach is prevascularization technique. There are two uh, approaches one is in vitro approaches and the in vivo approaches. Let us discuss each in detail. First one is the in vitro approaches. There are three approaches cell seeding, 
generation of spheroids and cell sheet technology. The first one is cell seeding. In this approach, you, uh, you seed the endothelial cells into the porous scaffold and incubate it over a period of time. Eventually, what will happen is there will be vascular network formation within this porous scaffold and then you implant at the site of interest. The second approach is a generation of spheroids. Spheroids are structurally three dimensional arrangement of cells with intensive cell to cell and cell to matrix interaction. There are several ways through which we can achieve the formation of the spheroids. If we choose endothelial cells and tissue specific cells for the formation of spheroids, what will happen is over a period of time there will be vascular network formation within these spheroids. Once the vascular network forms within these spheroids, then we can transfer these spheroids into the scaffold and then thereby we can achieve the uh, vascular network into the scaffold. The third approach is cell sheet technology. This technique is devoid of uh, any scaffolds. In these techniques what we use is thermosensitive polymer. For example, poly propel acrylamide. At, at 37 degrees Celsius, these thermosensitive polymer they allow the cell addition. So, at 37 degrees Celsius, you seed endothelial cells and tissue specific cell onto these uh, thermosensitive polymer and incubate it over a period of time until it reaches the monolayer formation. Once the monolayer is formed, you decrease the temperature to 20 degrees Celsius. What happens is at 20 degrees Celsius, these polymers they swell and the cell adhesion property of this polymer is lost. That leads to the peeling off of this monolayer from the polymer surface and these monolayer are stocked and then transferred to the site of interest. Thereby, we can achieve the vascular network formation at the site of interest. The next approach is in vivo approaches. In this, there is a technique called arteriovenous loop formation. As you see here, the uh, synthetic uh, synthetic vessel is connected to the artery and venous surgically and uh, this uh, after surgically connected to the artery and venous this uh, scaffold uh, this setup is implanted in vivo as you see here synthetic uh, synthetic vessel is looped inside this scaffold once we implant inside uh, over a period of time there will be a sprouting of capillaries into the scaffold as you see over here once, uh, once there is a sprouting of scapularies into the scaffold, you surgically remove from that site and implant it to the site of your interest that is injured site whatever, thereby we can achieve the uh, vascularization into the scaffold. Uh, which is an efficient strategy. As we know, all these techniques come with certain advantages and uh, disadvantages. For example, in, in case of scaffold design, it is easy to fabricate, but again the disadvantage is it relies on the ingrowth by host vasculature. In the second method, in vitro prevascularization, it does not rely on the in vitro uh, ingrowth by host vasculature, but again the perfusion rate is low compared to the in vivo prevascularization. But in case of in vivo prevascularization, though it does not rely on ingrowth by host vasculature and it involves uh, very rapid perfusion once uh, after implantation, but again this method involves the surgery. The fourth method is angiogenic uh, factor delivery. This approach has given a promising result, but again it depends on ingrowth by host vasculature. So, it is difficult to say which uh, strategy is an efficient one. Again, there are few other challenges in vascularization. For example, it is difficult to construct a tissue engineering scaffold with smaller capillaries whose diameter is less than 1 mm. And perfusion and vascularization is a significant problem in metabolically highly active organs like heart and liver. For example, in, he, in heart, the intercapillary distance is around 20 meter. Achieving such a highly vascularized tissue is a challenge. We next move on to the third challenge that is selecting proper cell source. In this section, we will talk about different types of stem cells which we have exploited in tissue engineering applications. Uh, as we know stem cells, stem cells have the potency to differentiate into many number of cells and we will talk about few of these stem cells which have been exploited in tissue engineering. The first one is mesenchymal stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells are multipotent adult stem cells. These stem cells are able to differentiate into several cell types of the body, but not all. 
These missing chemical stem cells can be isolated from different parts of the body for example, bone marrow, adipose tissue and dental tissues. But the problem with missing chemical stem cells they are multipotent, but not pluripotent. The second stem cells we, which we are talking about is uh, human embryonic stem cells. These uh, embryonic stem cells are isolated from inner mass of the blastocyst and these stem cells are pluripotent in nature that means they are able to give rise to any cell types of the body. But the problem associated with embryonic stem cells is the ethical concerns as we are extracting these stem cells from the embryo. And the recent development is induced pluripotent stem cells. What they have done is they induce pluripotency in the normal somatic cells. What they have done is they have introduced four genes into the uh, soma uh, most fibroblast cells and uh, thereby they could able to reprogram these somatic, somatic cells into the stem cells. Uh, stem cells. But the problem with uh, stem cells is their uh, proliferation capacity is very low in two dimensional cell culture plate. So, it is difficult to ex harvest uh, required number of cells with that is required for uh, our tissue engineering application. There are again sir, certain advance, advancements in conventional cell culturing uh, techniques. For example, exposing stem cells to the hypoxic condition led to the improvement in their survival. So, such advancements have been done quite recently. The another problem is maturity of these cells. Uh, these stem cells they have uh, they have largely uh, differentiate into immature cells uh, with variability in structure and function. And another problem which we face in uh, cells is uh, producing clinically relevant number of cells. For example, human myocardium consists of 10 to the power of 9 cells. Generating such a huge number of cells is again a challenge in tissue engineering. Thank you.